The United States economy accelerated in the second quarter. The Commerce Department says the nation's gross domestic product, or GDP, rose at an annual rate of 2.8 percent from April through June. That's more than the 1.9 percent rate economists had expected for the second quarter. Experts say the growth is due to an increase in consumer spending and business investing more in their inventories, despite the pressure of continually high interest rates. Jeff Stein joins me for more. He's a White House economics reporter for The Washington Post. Jeff, I'm going to run you through a couple of different questions here. You wrote a big takeout on economic warfare, which we're going to get to in a moment. But I want to first get your take on what this GDP growth tells us about the state of the economy and how you think the Fed will read that data. This is uh, one of the best days that people who work in the economic policy shop at the White House have had in a while. There was fears after the last um, GDP report that we could be heading for a slowdown induced by the interest rates that you referenced. But this is really a Goldilocks report in that it's not like we're seeing a pickup um, in GDP growth that's consistent with the reacceleration of inflation. The biggest source of the GDP growth that we saw was the increase in business inventories. And that is something that is not really responsive to um, interest rates the same way that consumer spending might be. And so people in the White House Democrats are quite optimistic that this report, while, um, you know, uh, not, you know, while, while, while still showing some heat in the economy, um, suggests that maybe um, the Fed could still cut, that there won't be a, an impetus to stop the to stop the, the attempt to cut because of this report, because of this acceleration. Now I'm going to take you to another story you wrote about recently on the topic of the economy. You wrote about um, Vice President, now likely Democratic nominee Kamala Harris's discussions about what, what um, is referred to as the care economy agenda. Explain what that is and, and what it seeks to achieve. Yeah, we're in this weird period right now that I'm sure you've noticed where everyone is kind of seeing what they want to uh, in the vice president. They're kind of projecting their hopes and seeing reflected back what they hope she'll be. And that's obviously a great place to be as a presidential candidate. But as the campaign goes on, she has to make some commitments. And one of the ones that she's actually been quite clear on is the set of expansions to the social safety net that Democrats tried under Biden that they weren't able to get through. Harris has signaled very clearly that she's interested in picking these up. And these poll really well. And they also address what a lot of people think are pretty severe crises um, for the bottom of the income distribution, but also for the middle class, a lack of um, paid family leave, a lack of child care, lack of elder care, um, issues with health care, sort of bread and butter economic issues for Democrats that Biden had made gestures toward, wasn't able to complete. But Harris has really, in her ability to sort of effectively deliver clear, cogent talking points, has really made clear that these, these are things that she wants to do. And we're still trying to figure out, you know, what are her priorities exactly? And I think she's been uh, quite deft at letting, as I said, sort of the unions think that she's on their side, letting the big businesses think that she's on their side more than Biden. Both of those can't be true, yeah. but found some smart middle grounds to stake out that both sides would be happy to see. Now, I want to get to your big takeout history of economic sanctions. You suggest they may not be successful or effective in many cases. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we have seen an astonishing increase in the level of economic warfare. And I'm really grateful that you're having me on to talk about it because under Obama, under under the Bush administration, right, under um, George W. Bush, we saw two truly disastrous wars that most Americans polling suggests were quite appalled by. There were huge numbers of casualties, including American troops, a loss of trillions of dollars of U.S. taxpayer money. And so there's been a, a response in, in the 15, 20 years since to say, we don't want to see American troops put in harm's way as much. And so the response from U.S. presidents has been, how do we continue to exert the U.S. role on the world stage? How do we continue to assert U.S. foreign policy dominance and, and act in our interest, and, and to put it less cynically, to try to improve outcomes in places where maybe dictators are doing terrible things or maybe regimes are suspending elections or torturing um, dissidents or whatever, how do we still respond to that without going to war? And so in that breach, we've seen a huge rise in, in these economic sanctions, these measures that restrict economic activities with these countries, which now we, we reported today are in effect in some form, not just on the whole country, but also often on individuals or companies, but on 30 3% of the entire world and 60% of all poor countries are under some mm -hmm. form of U.S. sanctions. It's a staggering increase from 20 years ago when it was really just Cuba and a couple other countries. So in the last 30 seconds we have left, it, 
they may not be effective. And then also, do they have downsides? I mean, the, you know, as you write, pushing countries into the arms of other countries with these sanctions. Yeah, we're seeing China and Iran and Russia really step up their attempts to work together because the premise of sanctions really depends on you know, dependence on the U.S. dollar. So if these countries decide that they don't need to access the Western financial system for complicated reasons, people should read about in my story. If if that's the case, then they can build their alternate sort of outside of that U.S. system financial ties. And we're seeing the U.S. adversaries do that, which risks making this tool less and less effective over time. So it's a, it's a fascinating issue. And it really has had tremendous consequences for tens of millions of people all over the world, Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, Nicaragua, um, I can spend the rest of the yeah. segment listing countries um, that have been affected by this. Well, it's um, really important reporting and people should read it because every day I feel like I'm announcing some new sanctions that are being imposed in one way or another. And this help puts it in great context. Jeff Stein with The Washington Post. Thank you so much, Jeff. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Jen.